And I find that the most successful entrepreneurs have worked somewhere else first. For you sure. know? That's how you learn how business works. Yeah, you're learning on somebody else's dime. Like, exactly. I tell my employees all the time, I'm like, learn on my dime. Hey, everyone. I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With The Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Welcome back to The Journey Podcast. It's Morgan Devon. I'm back again with another episode. I'm here with the amazing Les from Balanced Black Girl Podcast. I'm so excited. Welcome, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Morgan. Absolutely. So we're going to talk all things wellness Mm -hmm. and navigating going full-time in entrepreneurship, which you recently made that transition. And then lastly, I want to talk about just like your thoughts on some of the trending conversations around Mafia Girl Fitness and all types of trends happening on the TikTok and all types of things in the internet happening today. Oh my gosh, all my favorite things to talk about. I'm so excited. (laughs) So first, tell us about your journey. You most recently were with HubSpot, Mm -hmm. right? And you're doing content and social. And tell me like what made you eventually decide, you know what, I want to be a full-time content creator. Yeah. So well, my content creation kind of career started in 2014, I actually started off as a wellness blogger back in 2014 on the side of my then corporate job, which evolved so much to eventually become Balanced Black Girl, which I started in 2018. And truth be told, even back in 2014, when I was blogging, it was always my end goal to do content full time. Mm -hmm. That was always my intention was to make a career out of it. At the time, I had used it to transition from finance to marketing because at the time I was working in corporate finance and the work that I had been doing with content and freelancing qualified me for marketing roles. So that was how I eventually ended up at HubSpot. But it was always my North Star to do my own thing with my own brand and to make my own content full time. And last year in 2023, I just got to a point where I couldn't do both anymore and where continuing to do my full time job was hindering the business. And when I sat down and I put everything on paper, I was like, I'm actually losing money potentially by staying in my full-time job. And so it's time for me to focus full-time. Yeah. I love that. I actually had a similar experience when I was working full-time and then doing Blavity on the side. And then there was a point where like, I couldn't take calls. I couldn't have meetings. I couldn't just from like a time perspective, I couldn't actually take advantage of the opportunities that were coming my way because I had a day job. And so I think that's actually a really good threshold for people who are thinking about when do I make that leap? It's like, at what point are you slowing down your growth of your side hustle? Because you're dedicating all this time to your main job. Exactly. Exactly that. And did you have an assistant or a VA helping you? I did. Who I actually hired her very recently. I brought her on in the fall of 2023. Okay. So it's still been pretty recent working with her, but she's been amazing. She's my project manager who helps me manage all things behind the scenes of the podcast. And that just like opened everything up. And tell me about the Dear Media deal. Because you were independent for a while. Were you with the mm-hmm. network before? No. So I've been independent for almost the first five years of the podcast. Wow. Yeah. And then last year, Dear Media came to me expressing interest in the show. And I actually kind of sat on it for a while. I didn't want to make a rush decision. I took some time mm-hmm. to really think about it. I had other friends who are podcasters who worked with the network. I just, I really took some time to sit and think, okay, what would this mean for my show? What would this mean for my business? I talked to my attorney. I you know, Mm -hmm. talk to some other people in the industry, ultimately did decide that that was going to be the best decision for the next step of where I wanted to go. So I joined Dear Media also in the fall of 2023. It was like a big, that was a big time of transition last fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, so many people aspire to make content creation their full-time job and aspire to be able to do so in a way that they're not struggling, you know, where it's not like I'm going backwards with my finances by deciding to make this leap. And I think that having a podcast is a lot of work. I think people also underestimate the amount of effort that goes into the amazing things that you do, including all this, like the videos and the the cut downs and all of the things. I'm curious, what are the things that you learned in your day job that then allowed you to perhaps be more successful than someone who had just straight up 
just on content creation without the corporate career. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think corporate experience is so valuable. And I think a lot of people want to skip over that and go straight to entrepreneurship, which is fine if that's what they want to do. But working in corporate for so long taught me so much about just professionalism, business acumen, professional maturity, how to communicate, how to meet deadlines. Mm -hmm. I was a people manager. So I learned how to manage a team, which was so helpful when it came for me hiring for my business. Because if you've never managed people before, that is a very specific skill set. So yeah. I got to work at companies that paid me to learn how to manage people instead of having right. to just learn that on my own in my company where I would lose money. So I really I think it's amazing for learning and development. You can have mm -hmm. so many things at your fingertips in a corporate environment, courses, degrees that your company will pay for that you can then apply to your business. 100%. I completely agree. We did an episode a couple of weeks ago on going from a freelancer to full time at a company and then making the jump to being an agency owner and like really scaling a business versus just being a solopreneur. And I find that the most successful entrepreneurs have worked somewhere else first. For you sure. Know? That's how you learn how business works. Yeah. You're learning on somebody else's dime. Like, exactly. I tell my employees all the time, I'm like, learn on my dime. Like, yeah. do your work, take all that you can and go jump jump, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. And then tell me about your, your life now. You recently moved. What was that experience? Why did you decide to move? Yeah. So I've been a West Coast girl my whole life. I was born yeah. and raised in Seattle. I moved to LA in 2019, which mm -hmm. had its good parts and it had its challenging parts. I basically moved right before the pandemic. So that was, mm -hmm. it was really hard. It was a hard time to be in a brand new city, hard to meet people, kind of isolating. I think LA in and of itself without a pandemic can be really isolating. And then you add mm -hmm. not being able to leave the house on top of that. And that can be really difficult. But I made the best of it. And I had a good few years there. And about this time last year, I was like, you know, I just feel like I want to be somewhere else. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. what that is yet. I just mm -hmm. am feeling kind of stagnant in the little bubble that I created for myself in LA. So I ended up putting my stuff in storage. I went back to Seattle for a bit to spend time with my family. And then I just spent several months traveling. I was traveling around the US. I went to Europe for a little bit, had my little eat, pray, love moment. I kind okay. of called it my adult study abroad because I didn't get to study abroad in college. So it was like, oh, I can do this now, but I have like yes. money and, you know, and not in hostels and, you know, I can enjoy myself. <laughs> and then I ended up coming to New York for a little bit for what was supposed to be a short visit. And then I was like, wait, I'm actually meeting really great people here. I'm interviewing incredible podcast guests here. I'm getting mm -hmm. some great great networking in like I think that there's some opportunity for me here and I just felt a pull to make the move and so after the holidays I decided to come stay in New York so that's where I'm at now like brand new here and it's been a completely different experience but I'm having yeah. such a good time I rarely meet people who do the reverse like I know a lot know. of New Yorkers who are like I'm tired of New York like yeah. grueling mm -hmm. and then move to LA I rarely meet people who are from the West Coast who are like I'm gonna go to New York <laughs> yeah. I just watched down in New York when I was first fundraising, like early mid 20s. And I would like have hives. It was so stressful to me, like just getting off the plane, the airport where people are asking you if you want to need a taxi. I'm like, you're a scammer. Why are you scamming people who just <laughs> land in New York? You're bad for American culture. <laughs> you know, you get in the Uber, then you're dropped off on a cross street. And everyone's like, are you on seventh and fifth? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't right. know. Where I I'm new here. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just a girl from the Midwest. So the fact that you moved, I'm like, oh my God, like that's, that takes a lot of grit. I mean, you've lived like a few different lives. How old are you? I'm 34. And so part of me is, you know, one of my biggest regrets was like staying in my hometown all throughout my 20s because I didn't, you know, leave Seattle where I'm from, move from there until I was 30. And that if I would have had like the confidence and belief in myself to try a different city yeah. earlier. I wish I would have, but I didn't. And so a lot of what I felt in my 30s was like I created this stagnancy for myself in my 20s, and I'm not going to repeat that in this decade. So my 30s now is me just jumping in, doing the things, being like, I don't have another decade to sit at home like I did the last decade. So we're going to go right. make some things happen. Wow, that's dope. That's incredible. And tell me about like your perspective on content creation and the internet. So yeah. I could not figure out TikTok for the life of me. Like I have really? tried so many different versions of content. Now I'm sure once I say this, all the people are going to go in my comments and tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong on TikTok, which I'm open to the feedback. Go ahead and tell me <laughs> ladies, 
but I feel like TikTok is a really weird place. I get Instagram. I also have credibility on Instagram and it's like linear, right? Because the algorithm isn't as dramatic of showing people random people, right? It's like the people you follow and the people who your friends follow. On TikTok, I'll like post a video and then just the most random people will be there watching it. And I'm like, oh, you guys don't have any context on me. So I sound crazy if you're just like, who's this random black girl talking about wealth and business and this? And I'm like, well, I actually have credentials, you guys. Right, right. So it really feels like just the most weird, odd place. As a consumer, I love it. But as a content creator, as somebody who puts information back out into the world, I find it really challenging. How have you managed the TikTok versus Instagram balance? I feel really similarly. And maybe for us, it's like a millennial thing. I feel like Instagram, Mm. it's like you could put a piece of content up on Instagram and know exactly how it's going to perform. If you've been doing it long enough, you know exactly what's going to hit on Instagram and you can rinse and repeat. Versus TikTok, it is completely the Wild West. It is a total draw. It could do great. It could flop. It could do okay. And then three months from now, all of a sudden, you have an influx of people and it blows up. And it's just kind of the Wild West. And I do think the randomness of it is what makes it fun as a consumer. But as a creator, Mm -hmm. it is kind of hard to crack the code. And so, and I don't feel like I've really kind of found my groove on TikTok yet either. Mm -hmm. I've almost been... Oh, thank you. Uh, but it maybe almost, it's because I'm a millennial. <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you kind of get it. Yeah, I've yeah. almost been treating it kind of like a close friends on Instagram. Mm. It's like stuff that I wouldn't really post other places or like maybe it's a similar. I posted the same video on Instagram, but I cut it down to be a little bit mm-hmm. more curated. And then in TikTok, I'll leave it a little longer with all of my thoughts and like ad libs and side comments and ways for people to feel like they kind of know me as a person Mm -hmm. a little bit more Mm -hmm. kind of things in the family. Like I think my actual first mention of me being full time on my podcast was in a TikTok. I just put a caption Mm -hmm. like day in my life as a full time podcaster, but I hadn't actually announced it anywhere else. So that's kind of how I'm treating it. And it's been good for engagement quality over quantity because I then have people in my comments who are looking forward to it and they're rooting for me and they're excited. I also did have a video. It was almost two years ago that went viral on TikTok that I wasn't even in. It was just a voiceover from a clip of a podcast. And I had so many people in the comments being like, is this balanced black girl? I recognize your voice. And I have to be honest, I don't know if I would recognize someone's voice without seeing them just from a random clip online. And so that was also what showed me like, okay, there are people here who are really engaged in. in a different way. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's I feel like the a puzzle. Way. I feel the same way. I didn't share my pregnancy much on Instagram because I've got a lot of men who follow me and like people are weird on Instagram. I announced I was pregnant. I lost like so many followers. Anytime I posted anything about baby pregnancy, anything just unfollows, which is fine because go ahead and leave. But I found it interesting. I was like, that's fine. I don't need to, I'm a business person. I can post all my entrepreneurship stuff there. But on TikTok, similarly, I used it as kind of like a digital diary. And so I posted a lot of pregnancy stuff. So it was funny because people on LinkedIn had no idea I was pregnant. Still have no idea that I had a baby. (laughs) People on Instagram kind of know, but you know, you could have missed it. And then people on TikTok were like, how's, where's the baby? How's the baby? What's going on? (laughs) Why haven't you posted the baby? Is everything okay? And I'm like, everyone calm down. They're invested. I agree. I feel like people on TikTok get like really engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They like want to know who you are as a person in totality versus on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what can you teach me? This specific thing that I followed you for, I only want that versus for TikTok. If you only show one side, they're like, wait, but what about all these other sides? I want to see it all. What are you eating? What's in your fridge? I think in some ways, I think TikTok is fun like that. Do you have a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube channel for the podcast. So I share Mm. video episodes of the podcast. And I think for me, for YouTube, I'm good with that. Like, I don't know if I want to be a YouTuber, Mm. like YouTube vlogs and things like that. It just doesn't appeal to me to like create a lot of work. It is. I'm like, I don't want to film myself going to Target and doing this like 45 minute vlog. (laughs) And moving the camera. At times in Target. Yeah, to get it done. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. I feel like I, same thing. This podcast is up on YouTube and I like the engagement that it has because I feel like it's people who actually are podcast listeners who want to watch the video because I'm very expressive. I use my hands. I'm like, you kind of have to watch it to understand what I'm saying. But I do feel like you can't grow a YouTube channel unless you really want to make YouTube content. 
which is different. Yes, correct. And just exactly. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about monetization. I'm so curious. If you had to have a Venn diagram of your world, now that you're a full-time content creator or even a pie chart, how would you yeah. allocate the different buckets of ways that you've been able to monetize? Yeah, it's cha- it's shifted quite a bit. So when I mm-hmm. first started, particularly the podcast, I had already had a few years of kind of Instagram influencer, wellness blogger, and I'd already been making money in that space for a few years. And yeah. I was still working a nine to five. So at that time... I would use the money that I made from influencing to fund the podcast. And then my nine Mm -hmm. to five was how I lived Mm -hmm. because starting a podcast can also be expensive and very resource Mm -hmm. intensive. So that was what I did for several years until I got to the point where I could monetize the podcast. When the podcast got big enough, I started running ads on the podcast from sponsors and still for a while, most of the money that I was making was coming from social media partnerships. It was probably about 60% social media sponsors Mm -hmm. and maybe 40% podcast ads. And then back in 2022, it it reached kind of a tipping point where it was like 50-50 once the podcast got a bit bigger. And then last Mm -hmm. year, it kind of swung the other way where now it's probably about 60% ad right. revenue from the podcast and you know about 40% from social media sponsorships which is great but now that I'm full time I'm like okay I can't just rely on brands for revenue so some of my big goals for this year are expanding into other ways that I can make money directly. So podcast merch is coming soon. Physical Yay. products are coming soon. Digital products coming soon, which I'm really excited to be able to like directly serve my audience. You didn't say way. membership. You didn't say subscribers. I did not. I did not. I used to have a few different memberships. I've done the Patreon thing. Mm. I also had kind of like a wellness self-care membership for a while. Mm-hmm. And they, it just didn't like land for me as a creator. Like I had people in my audience who were interested, Mm -hmm. but I just creating like bonus content and like the community management side of things. It just like wasn't work that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I was like, yeah, this isn't something that I want to continue. Yeah. I have a membership for work smart and Mm -hmm. for entrepreneurs. And I think the thing with memberships that people underestimate is it's a lot of work all the time. Right. So we, when I got pregnant, I was like, you know what? I can't do this this year. So everything is self-study. People can decide what they want to kind of DIY it for themselves. They get all the videos. And then when I'm back off mat leave, then I'll turn it back on and people can sign up for the membership. But it is a lot of effort. Yeah. And it's, it's constant, you know, it's every Mm -hmm. month, new programming, new things. And so I was like, you know, it just like wasn't work that I enjoyed. Yeah. I respect that. I want to go back to the cost of podcasts and the fact that you Mm -hmm. reinvested in yourself, because again, I think so many people skip over what it takes to actually be a full-time successful person who gets paid to be themselves. Right. And I have talked about this actually in the last few episodes because I just really want people to understand the steps that it takes to be able to do these things. And what you said was you had your full-time job and that covered your living expenses, right? And that was like your operating cost just to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. Then you had your income that was coming in from brand deals and sponsorships from social. And it's not like you went out and bought a Gucci bag. You reinvested (laughs) that money, right? Back into a new product that you were trying to build, which is your podcast, yeah. so that you could grow and scale that. And it wasn't until that's five years, like yeah. that's a long time more almost, you know, mm-hmm. that you reinvested that income, not to change your quality of life, not to do all these things, but to build a more sustainable platform for yourself so you could make that leap. That takes a lot of self-discipline and not getting distracted, especially mm-hmm. in this world of consumerism. So yeah, like shout out to you for real. And <laughs> Did you have separate savings accounts? Like walk us through how you actually did that because there's someone listening right now who's like, okay, I'm willing to make that short-term sacrifice of three, four years Mm -hmm. so that I have a long-term freedom and flexibility to work for myself and have diversified income and know that I'm going to be able to make money regardless of what happens in the marketplace. How did you actually set that up for yourself? 
Yeah, no, I really appreciate you saying that. I do consider myself a very disciplined person. And it dawned on me recently that I was like, I think my discipline is my superpower. And I think that served me in content in wellness is like my ability to just lock in. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, from the second I started making money from content, I set up a business and I always had very separate personal and business finances and never Mm -hmm. convoluted the two. So, Mm -hmm. you know, got my business set up, hired an accountant, had Mm -hmm. my, you know, business checking account, saving account, credit card, anything that is for the business gets, you know, paid for from that. Any salary that I pay myself as an employee gets paid out of the business. And I always kept it very, very separate. So it was very Mm -hmm. easy for me to see what was coming in, what was going out, what was getting reinvested back into the business. I always say, that's not my money. That's balanced black girl's money. And there's a very big difference between my money and her money. (laughs) That's what I say about black. It's like, daddy black, you paid for that. That is not Morgan Black's money. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it, I always had that mindset from day one, like that is not my money. That is the right. business's money. That is the platform's money. And mm-hmm. everything that, you know, circulates from it is to help the platform and even compensating myself as an employee. Right. Because if I'm not compensated, I can't show up and host. But that's a line item just like everything else. Mm-hmm. I think that's so important that people don't commingle funds separate bank accounts. And then also to your point, I think it's great that you were paying yourself, even if it's an owner's draw, like at the end of the year, where it's like, I'll take some percentage of profits and keep some in. Like, I think it's important that people think about how they're setting up their business account and then how within their business account, what are you using for reinvestments? What are you using for yourself? And then what are you using just to operate, you know, to be able to afford the virtual assistant or personal assistant or executive assistant to be able to buy the equipment and things like that. And too often I see entrepreneurs just have like one account. (laughs) And I think that can really be detriment to how quickly you can grow. Because you can also see what your general balance is of your bank account and see, oh, wow, I'm actually doing well. Like it's a bit of an affirmation when you have a bank account that's just for business. You're like, oh, this is growing and I have some invoices out and Mm -hmm. like, okay. And in my opinion, it helps build confidence. When I look in the Debonico account, I'm like, okay, girl, like we're doing things, you know? And Mm -hmm. I think that's so important that people have that clarity. And so it can ground them in, yes, you're doing a good job. Stick with it. This can be hard, but like one step at a time. 100%. Yeah. And a resource I forgot to mention that can be really helpful. It was helpful for me was I read the book Profit First. Have you read that book before? Absolutely. Yeah. It's super helpful for anybody who wants to figure out how to structure their business finances because it tells you, okay, what percentage do you save for taxes? What percentage do you save to pay yourself? What percentage do you save for operating expenses? And learning kind of that flow of funds just helps you manage things more. It's so good. Profit First. And then the other book that I recommend for people, it's a little weird because a lot of people aren't thinking about this yet. It's called Built to Sell. Built to Sell is a book and also has a podcast that I think is really good, but basically it teaches you how to build a business that can operate without you. So even if you're not going to sell the company, like even if you're like, I'm never going to sell this, you can at least feel comfortable going away for six months and coming back and the business will have made money or you, you know, you know what systems to put in place and it's just a good gut check. So I read that book once a year for both Blavity and my personal businesses, because it's like, okay, I'm not selling the company, but like, if I were, where are my weaknesses and what are things I need to improve? Ooh, that's so good. I wrote that down because I yeah. add that to my list to read next for sure. <laughs> so good. And I do have a reading list for anyone who's listening in. You can go to morgandebond.com and get my reading list. Profit First is on there. Built to Sell is on there. A couple of other ones as well. Okay. So let's talk about the girls' trends happening. Right now. <laughs> There's so many um, trends. They come so fast now. How, like who makes these? Do you have a perspective of like the origin of how these things are made? Where does this stuff come from? I mean, I think TikTok has really accelerated trends for Mm. sure because Mm -hmm. the way things can go viral, one person can say something and then all of a sudden it's a trend that everybody is talking about. And I think that's why the trend cycle is so short because it's like TikTok specifically is helping things move so quickly. Mm -hmm. My favorite trend from last year was the cottage cheese and the chicken sausage with the mustard. Did you ever eat that? I did not. I mean – I eat all those things separately, but I didn't but not know that. Together. No. That's the weird thing about trends is sometimes I feel like you just get in this echo chamber where it feels like everyone yes. in the universe is doing this. Right. And then 
every time I mention the chicken sausage with the cottage cheese and the mustard, people stare at me. I'm like, was this not all <laughs> over your feed? Am I weird? Well, now that my phone hears us talking about this, I'm sure I'll get served it later today. I'm but... sure you will. <laughs> what was your favorite trend from last year? My favorite trend from last year. I mean, I thought that it was really great when all the girlies were doing Pilates. Um, oh, the, the like Lori Pilates Harvey. trend, the Lori, Lori Harvey Pilates trend I thought was yes. good just because it got people moving. I'm still a wellness girly at heart. It got the girlies trying new workouts and I'm always all about that. And I also think that the soft life trend mm -hmm. just started a lot of interesting conversation. I don't even know mm -hmm. if I necessarily have super strong feelings about the trend in one way or another, but it just started a lot of very interesting conversation. And mm -hmm. I just liked being a fly on the wall and hearing what people had to say about it. Yeah, I love the soft life trend. The other one that has been popping up a lot, probably because my phone is listening, is like stay at home moms who don't struggle. It's yes. like stay at home moms are like, I'm a kept woman. What are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. I go get my nails done. Everything is good. I'm like, oh, what a dream. <laughs> yes, yes. More recently, I've noticed that you've been posting a lot about relationships and living in your single girl era. Mm -hmm. How's that going? Yeah. I mean, you know, my single girl era is feeling more just like a single girl life at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, that's all right. It's uh, it's it's where I'm at. It's It's what my life looks like. And so I'm just really embracing that. But I know that a lot of people may not necessarily feel that way and want mm. to be more, I don't even know if proactive is the right word, but they're a bit more adamant on, you know, figuring that area of their lives out. So it's like, we've talked about it on the podcast or creating content about it to try to help those people who may be ready to like really dive in and show that area yeah. of their lives some love and mm -hmm. give them some, some support of balanced ways to do that really hard. What are the kind of things that you're telling people for those who might be interested in listening to those podcast episodes? Yeah, we had a really great episode recently uh, featuring Demona Hoffman, who's a really fantastic dating expert. She's been an OG podcaster in the game. She's been like helping people find love for almost two decades. And she recently wrote a book called F the Fairy Tale, which is basically mm -hmm. like decondition yourself from all of the programming that you've heard because it's actually mm -hmm. not in your greatest good understand who you are and what your values are because that's what's most important for you know helping you have a lasting partnership and so we had a conversation just really helping the girlies prioritize what's important if they're seeking yeah. a partner for long-term compatibility and ways that they can feel just more affirmed as they seek that yeah, I feel like that's so important. I had Yvonne Orji on the podcast a while back and she was talking about that she's not begging anyone to see her or right. to understand her value. And I think that so much of the society and the internet and like a lot of the, the male dominated radio and podcast hosts have just, particularly for black women and ambitious women have made it seem like, oh, you guys are lucky if somebody wants to be with you because you're difficult, you've got a lot going on, you know, you're not necessarily a subservient woman, all the things. And I think it can really mess with your psyche. So I love the episode that you did, just helping women have this ideas and help the girls be like, no, this is fine. This screw these voices, turn that down. I'm actually okay. Mm -hmm. I don't have to operate from a deficit mindset right. that I'm like entering yeah. a world with a deficit. You are a gift. This should be okay. This doesn't have to be so emotionally draining to even enter. People have so much anxiety exactly. just to enter the dating world. Right. Exactly. And it, it ultimately should feel good. It's going to be hard to find something that feels good if the process doesn't feel good. Yeah. If you have a lot of stress around it. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. What else should people look forward to in your world this upcoming year? Yes. Okay. So lots of exciting things for Balanced Black Girl coming up. So as I said, we're finally going to have some merch, which is coming, more amazing episodes. I also am hoping to go on tour later this year, um, Ooh, doing nice. live shows in our major cities. So be on the lookout for that likely in the fall. Very, very like? excited. Tell me about that process. Yeah. So I have gone through my analytics to identify the top cities where most of my listeners are, which most of it is kind of like major cities, yeah. you know, New York, LA. DC, 
Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so we're planning on doing some some live conversations in those cities so that our communities there can meet us and meet each other and just another fun way to to engage. So I'm really excited for that. I love that. I think you're going to wind up with the membership again. <laughs> Do you? If you're having live events. Yeah. You know, and you're going to connect the women who have the same interests and values together. It's hard to make friends as a woman mm -hmm. after college and after like kind of that shared experience when we're younger. It's really hard. And it's hard to find women who have the same values. You know, there's cohorts of women that love to party, that love to hang out, that want to be at the bars, want to be doing hookah and all types of things. And then there's the cohort of girlies who are like, hey, let's go on a Pilates date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Exactly. And not always easy to find those people, especially if you're moving around a lot, which I feel like our generation does. I bet that they're gonna they're gonna ask you for <laughs> a way to stay connected. I love that you what you said about making friends. One, because it's very true. But last year we did an episode all about friendships and like platonic mm -hmm. intimacy, making friends as an adult. And it was not only our most popular episode of 2023, it was the most popular episode we've ever done. And really? I wasn't, I was not expecting the episode to just like blow up like that. Most listened to, most shared, people wow. loved it. So we also have more friendship content coming this year to expand mm -hmm. on some of the things we talked about. But yeah, it really is my vision, at least in those live events, to be able to have some space where people can connect with one another. Connecting with one another. I'm like, that's way better. Y'all hear me talk all the time. Who cares if, yeah. I'm, if I'm there? I want y'all to connect with one another and meet each other and make friends. That's right. The facilitator, everybody else, y'all got it. Yeah. I feel the same way. In terms of the tour, because I feel like it's really interesting that podcasters, I've been just been noticing that people have been doing this a lot more. I think the first person I heard of that was doing live events for the podcast was my leak. And mm -hmm. I remember she did a couple events in Atlanta and they would just like sell out so fast. I mean, people love my leak. I love my leak. The world loves my leak. Do you feel like it's going to be a new business? like product offering for you and your like brand partnerships? That's what I'm hoping for. So we're working on securing brand partnerships for it now. So I would mm -hmm. love that. I would love for that to be a future avenue for us, for sure. So good. Okay, so we've got the tour coming. You're working on friendship content. You're working on relationship content. Mm -hmm. and, and you're working on merch. Are you yes. drop shipping the merch or what's your plan for how you're building out merch? Yeah, well, thankfully, Dear Media has a merch team who oh, helps us great. with the merch, which is great. That, that's why it's happening because then I'm like, I live in a studio apartment, me packing orders of merch in here. That's why I was like, how are we doing this merch? Tell me more. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, through our partnership with Dear Media, they're helping with the merch. So I'm designing it, concepting it, and then they create it and get oh, it man. to our amazing people. So very that. excited. That is the benefit of partnerships. And there's another book I recommend called The Sumo Advantage, which is a mm. book about how you can grow faster through partnerships oftentimes, and you should think about who are the complementary partnerships where it's not a competition. It's not like there's no deficit. It's only one plus one equals three. And also you can have partnerships for certain seasons. You know, it's yeah. not like something that you do now has to exist for five years, 10 years. It could be, we're going to do this thing for two years. Even if I'm not making any money, I might be growing to build this foundation. And then in two years, I can reevaluate things. I know nothing about Dear Media's terms or anything. They actually declined me twice, this podcast twice. Really? You know, fascinating. It's fine. I'm over it because we're, we're doing really well. But yeah, you're doing amazing. Yeah, it's fun. It's great. But I always had to tell the people, like, it's okay to be declined. Even though now I just have a chip on my shoulder about the podcast world. But anyways, the point is you can have partnerships with different people and that can help you grow much, much faster. So it's great to hear that you're having that experience. Yeah. And I'm glad that they assigned you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, that that was kind of my goal because I was independent for so long. I was I was nervous about like, okay, if I join a network, what does that mean? And I, yeah. I had had some other networks reach out who just had like terrible contracts where I was like, no, they're trying to own my IP. I'm not down with that. That's not, you know, so no. bad. So keeping my IP was huge, but I also just wanted something that was very creator friendly where I'm like, okay, if I do this, you know, for this year or for this two years, how can I leverage the resources that come with that and then reevaluate what works for me? And so that's been my mindset with it. What are some books or advice or things that you feel like women who identify with you, who want to follow your journey? Um, of course, they should listen to your podcast. They should follow <laughs> you on Instagram and TikTok, but any other resources that you want to direct them to? Oh my goodness. Oh, such a great question. So I'm 
always reading. I usually have at least like two books going at once. I I have what I like to call my like self-help morning reads and then my nighttime fiction to like turn my brain mm-hmm. off and unwind. Um, currently reading The 5 a.m. Club as my nonfiction read. So it, it I actually have mixed feelings about this book, but I'm trying to see it through. But it does have it's some ambitious. good. I'm it is ambitious. It. It's I feel like it's a little I'm like, why is this book 300 pages for something that could have been like it's repetitive? 20? Yeah. It is. But if sometimes, you know, I'm I'm building grit. I'm getting through it. A good one for, for people who may want to improve their morning routines. Uh, but a book that I actually read last year that I really loved was a memoir by a friend of mine, Nicole Walters, called Nothing is Missing. That was just a really great book that had not only elements of memoir, but she was also teaching in it. And it was Mm -hmm. just really inspiring. And for me, helped energize me around the power of choice and how Mm -hmm. how much choice that I do still have over the things that happen in my life and and really taking accountability for that. So that was a really good book. Another great book that has really helped me is called Reach Out. I also read that last fall. Mm -hmm. It's a good one for anyone who really wants to just build their network and have stronger relationships with people who are already in their network. It provides like a really easy to follow framework of ways to follow up with people, to stay top of mind, to support people in your network, Mm -hmm. how to ask people in your network for support. It was just like a really good, straightforward read for anybody who maybe feels a little stiff networking or or needs a little help. It makes it really easy and really human. So those are two good books that I read recently that um, That's such a good one. Sometimes I have a hard time reaching out to people and I I just like batch it. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to do all my outreach this week. Mm-hmm. And then I'm done for like yep. two months and I'll do it again. So good. Well, thank you so much for joining the Journey Podcast. I look forward to hanging out with you soon. Yes. You're coming on Balanced Black Girl soon. So I'm very excited to have I you. Wait. I can't wait. We can talk all things that relationships. Absolutely. I mean, you have had so many amazing transitions in your life over the past year. So I'm really excited to dig into those and just hear about how that's going for you and how you're feeling. So subscribe to both of our podcasts, everyone. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Leave us a review. Leave me a review. Go to Balanced Black Girl. Listen to her episodes. Leave her a review. And we'll see you guys soon. See you. Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. And look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.